with me, right? Okay, here we go, Liam. This, Ivy, this is about Hegel. Okay, okay. Liam. So what I did understand is that he is, Hegel is different from Kant because he takes a very religious approach to art where it's kind of like a representation of the spiritual in the world. Um, and eventually I think he talked about historical paintings being completely rational. And I think he said that they were separated from the divine and that art should represent natural things like the natural self, the natural world, whether it be organic or inorganic. So I think that he would really like all landscape paintings, not all actually. I think he would dislike things like um, Sunday in the park, even <laughs> though it is like natural. I think that it's, that is separated from what God made and puts it more in the context of things other than like worship or appreciation of what could be called spiritual or what might look spiritual. Um, so I think Sunday in the Park is one he wouldn't like. I think he would like Catholic churches because <laughs> Catholic churches are pretty and and they have a point to be spiritual, um, but not for the reason of it being a representation of anything other than God's grace, which it, from what I understand, is important to him. Um, and the that even inorganic things represented through art can be really nice like really good um but i i'm not sure he would like much sculpture but i think he would like the biblical sculpture sculptures so i think he might not like um oh gosh he might not like the baphomet statue that got put in at at the little rock capital but the what statue would, the baphomet statue the the satanist statue that they used to kind of say hey, you have to do this if you're going to put the Ten Commandments there because that way it's respecting more. Very of good. Religion. I thought that yeah. was a great move. It was awesome. I thought it was hilarious. And I also thought it was incredible until they took it down. And then I was really sad. Um, Isn't that against so the definitely law? Like Can't you sue them? Well, I think they took down both. Okay. So There's fair. I, yeah, since they took down both statues or both... Um, religious things they were like it's fair um, it wasn't supposed to be there in the first place right the yeah. ten commandments boy that's yeah. annoying that's they have that in batesville too i think don't they they used to i'm i'm not sure but if they do i know what i can petition for <laughs> yeah i mean um, you should check it out because i honestly think at least they used to but all these things I try to block out of my head because they're so distressing. And I, after 20, so you can imagine after 27 years, I have a button, you know, I'll see something and I have this 27 year history. It just goes down the rabbit hole. So I tried really hard to just stay in my office all the time because I just couldn't take it. Yeah. Um, so being in Indonesia is really nice because everybody here is committed to religious pluralism and teaching yeah. Islam at a very sophisticated level, but entirely governed by pluralistic analysis. It's Which is incredible. Nice. Yeah. I mean, if you want to go to a more spiritually developed place, get the hell out of... <laughs> half of america you know yeah isn't that too um, bad liam yep luckily luckily there are plenty of people that are completely against that i'm a singularity um but anyways on on statues i think he'd hate the baphomet statue but i think he he might really like the statue of david because it is not only a representation of um a biblical story, but also I think it represents the nat the natural human, which can be said God created this. So I think because of the argument that you can make that this is this is God's intention, that he would really like the statue of David. I think he would call it classical Christian art. Because classical was this 
purification of the body, right? Yeah. So I think he might, I'm trying to think of what's symbolic, you know, symbolic Christian art. Um, do you remember he had those three phases where the East had this very bizarre symbolism? It was a less cultivated kind of symbolic. It was a more primitive kind of symbolism. So I was thinking of Kumarasawami, remember those heads with uh, yeah. black and white stripes? Yeah. And Kumarasawami said, you know, it's not about a physical face, it's about the spiritual. And you make the face look like that so that it will get you to the spiritual, right? Yeah. But Hegel is saying that the spirit is incarnating itself into history. And, it, and he just happened to be born into the place where it's reached its highest level of incarnation, which is Lutheranism, a republic where you elect leaders and what was the third part? It was just this highest level of culture. Um, anyway, um, this is like the Western bias in favor of progress, right? Do you remember ever since the Enlightenment, these people thought we were making progress and we weren't ever going to look back? Yeah, I think I don't. Okay, yeah, I'm. That's okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's okay. I'll just. I'm trying to think. Do you have any other questions or comments? Did you find it just confusing, or did you find it compelling, or could you figure out how he's reacting to human kind? I think. I think it's going to be similar to to twentieth century French feminism where it's just if I had more of the language like his I'd find it much more compelling but I I found myself just having to kind of be like okay I don't think Kant would like that okay I don't think he would like that and just trying to read it in more of a, a, a I guess a contrary way where I was really just trying to take it bit by bit and compare it to what we already have um, which isn't always the best for learning a new philosopher, but it's it works when the language is a bit more difficult. Yeah, why do they make the language like that? If I mean, if you really care about women, why the hell do you have a language that only a very few, mostly Western white privileged women sitting in their offices who either never had kids or never took time to take care of them or never occurred to them anything they did raising kids had anything to do with feminism. I mean, yeah. why would you that do was, that, Liam? That did become a big point in, in the course where like eventually there is the, the changing of language and it flips to be a much more colloquial way to speak because eventually they were like, well, we gotta, we gotta reach everybody. And they that was-, that was they, they deconstructed deconstruction, right? Yep. Like you're violating your own principle. Yeah. Because you're you've created another language that's just a tool to oppress, right? Yeah. But I mean, really, you couldn't figure that out from the beginning. And actually, yeah. you're just bouncing off of those privileged Western white French men, and you're just sort of a wannabe trying to get their approval. And, which was always the problem. Like women never would come into their own. They kept yeah. letting men define the terms and the same with race and the same with, uh, you know, developing world, ethnicity, religion, very annoying. Um, anyway, did, did you talk about, I know Mr. Martell wrote a book about 
mothers, right? And something like the trashing of mothers or something. Did you ever talk about that? Um, I think we talked about places, like the place one can find in motherhood, everything from like the solace they can find or the um, oppression that they may find in motherhood. And that was something that we found in multiple sources, but we, I, it wasn't a big topic. I don't think it was something we touch on at points, but All it right. wasn't something we dealt with. Does it that women who are mothers feel oppressed by motherhood? It, okay, so I think specifically with, um, I think it was Dupont, um, where she would talk about women being set to the role of mother when in reality, that is not a thing that they are inherently drawn to. It is a, it is a choice to be. It, where a lot of women are forced to be mothers when in reality, they, it, it is a choice as in the same as like growing your hair out versus cutting it off and things Does like that. Does she ever say that being a mother is great, but in a patriarchy, the role of motherhood sucks? Yeah. Yeah, okay. because a, a lot of it was in contrast to the patriarchy, because, I mean, other than the patriarch, you have the matriarch, but the matriarch isn't taken seriously because of the role of mother, where it becomes her job to have the children rather than to lead the generation. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a mom. It's just the way you get yeah. treated that, yeah. you know, to me, birth is the wellspring of a society like that's yeah. the wellspring and we poison it right at the beginning you know you got to get back to work in two weeks you're gonna lose your job I yeah. mean it's awful so the problem is what a patriarchal greed driven society does to it and then yeah. what that says about the relation between culture and nature but I just don't know if women feminists even do that. I mean, some of them just say that the role by nature is oppressive. It's just like, huh? Like this is the whole source of the next gender. This is, why would you denigrate giving life, right? I mean, there's something yeah. super unhealthy about that. And for women to do it, uh, just like, yeah, I teach that class and it drives me nuts. Um, yeah. Lots of things do. Okay, so what about Hegel? Um, all right, so one thing I'll just mention. Okay, do you remember when he said that everything, even natural scenes, if they're run through the mind, they're superior just because the human geist is a superior level of being. I don't remember that, no. Okay, so it's right at the beginning of the second reading, but okay, does this make sense to you? That when art, when artists, uh, paint landscapes or they describe emotions it's a higher level of being geist yes. because it's self-conscious awareness you're self-consciously yeah. aware that you're looking at this and you're viewing it is a spiritual act it you don't yeah. just like open your eyeballs and take it in right yeah, wasn't art to Hegel a, a way of spiritual development? Yes, and that's why. Okay. I do okay. remember that. I just, yeah. So uh, natural scenes is the least spiritual subject matter of art, right? Yeah. But he says just to paint the scene is the first step in separating Geist from nature, right? Yeah. So there's, you know, this classic, we talked about this before in the caves in France, 
the caveman, he paints a buffalo, right? Or a, it's really beautiful. Have you ever seen that? Those paintings? Uh, let me look them up just in case. I can't remember the name of the cave. I can't imagine there's that many cave paintings in France. Right. You can't find it, huh? Like, um, I'm seeing some, but I'm not sure. Lasso, L-A-S-C-A-U-X, is that the one? Yeah, is it, it's, a, it's nice, right? Yeah. And so somebody like Collingwood, I think Collingwood said this. I'm, again, I don't think I made you read all of it, Collingwood. But he says, you know, if the point is to sort of get yourself up to go get the buffalo, you could have just done a stick figure, you know, go for it. You know what I mean? But the, yeah. art, the guy really made it a work of art, right? You, yeah. I mean, there's no way there must have been, people must have recognized that that particular person made a painting that was a hell of a lot better than this person, right? And yeah. they, pick, they pick their best person. Um, yeah. Think, yeah, it is amazing. I think, one of the, I think one of the interesting aspects of art is how it can always relate to like an, anthropological studies. Yes. And specifically when it comes to cave paintings, it's, and at least in my understanding, one of the most interesting parts is the, the switch from hunter-gatherer to agrarian culture, because hunter-gatherers supposedly had much more free time and leisure time. And for all we know, there are, there's so much art that was not, um, what's the word, preserved, because it just wasn't ever an occurrence. Like, why would you save art when it is just something you've done to pass the time while you're having to chew your meat? And uh, specifically in these things, I think that some some of the um what what period do we call the art philosophy because we're not classical are we no it's before uh, it's before greece right okay i mean there's yeah. before greece somewhere else in the west and then there's this you know it's just like uh. i i think that a thing that most of the philosophers that we are going to study is that they they don't have as much of, as, of an anthropological grasp as we do now. So I think that that's, all, that's an interesting thing about cave paintings and leisure and just how the idea behind these creations could have been back then compared to now, because it's two different types of, of human civilization, if you can call hunter-gatherer civilization. Well, that's the problem, right? <coughs> that the guys, the people we're reading probably wouldn't think it's very valuable. I mean, who cares? Yeah. What's important is that the West is on this cutting edge of restructuring the psyche and society. Like, why do, I mean, we can go back there in order to s observe how primitive they are. I think Kant even did that. But you yeah. don't go back there to get insights, right? Okay, yeah. so let me show you what I went and bought yesterday, okay? Okay. Voila, right? Nice. Oh, isn't that yeah, cool? That's a nice shirt. Yeah, it is. It's it's batik, like all my Indonesian. But the reason, and it's you know they copy very old, old indigenous patterns, and this it goes back to Rollo May, like right? Even yeah. people long ago. They, they don't just wear clothes. They have color, sensitive to color and shape design, symbolic. Some of this was probably symbolic, those sorts of yeah. forms. I don't think probably the people who make these shirts know what the symbols were. They do know that um, different areas had their sort of unique color or in Chirabon, they always had the shape that followed the what the clouds in that area look like. So yeah. yeah, I mean, this could have something to do with the kind of trees or leaves they had or something. Anyway, everything is meaningful. 
we're we're ascetic creatures right we can't live yeah. by bread alone and so i mean hegel would say that's okay does he get that like it's basic stuff but it's going through the the geist it's just not as self-consciously aware right I mean, they couldn't say to themselves, ah, I'm part of the, you know, incarnation of Geist, right? Because the yeah. whole the whole thing about Hume, Kant, Hegel, is that they'll say that in the past, especially he uh, Kant, in the past, like he'd say the Ten Commandments, okay, they are the product of reason, but not self-consciously so, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. The people really yeah. thought God, <laughs> you know, did it. Um, and But then Kant said, we've reached this level where what we are self-conscious of is the moral law and the capacity to think and laws. Well, Hegel would say, right, that actually the Ten Commandments are the incarnation of Geist, not the, you know, just this, yeah. the, okay. Um, the other, okay, so Hume, Hume's goal, you know, empathy would be Hegel's um, very low level incarnation of Geist. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, um, it can be symbolic, it like the pointillism and all that. I mean, the fact that the impressionists were trying to imitate the way the eyeball looks at sees through in points is not right, it's not geist, it's anti-geist, it's trying to make a science of art, right? Yeah. So Kant and Hegel, remember neuroscience, how your body responds to, you know, they'll do all that research about how your body responds to these uh, waves, sense what, you know, auditory waves or these visual waves or, and yeah. that's kind of, that's kind of what um, Hinduism, yoga, is about that, right? The chakras. Yeah. Um, and so I think Hegel would say, all that stuff worked out by the Hindus is, um, is that first level of Geist, uh, the incarnation of Geist, but at this very physical level and very symbolic, right? The pictures of people were very, symbolic in this non that they're not like what we look like right yeah so and the reason was they thought of geist as karma just energy it wasn't incarnated in human life right are you there yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I didn't realize you were looking for a response there. Oh, well, if you, I mean, if you think about it, the whole, the whole point is looking for the Atma inside of you, like you're a little chunk of the spirit of the universe to try to get in touch with it. Yeah. Uh, and that would be where Hegel would say, there is this awareness of the spirit as opposed to the flesh but yeah. it is very uh, primitive, <laughs> right? Yeah. That I mean, you have to get this in order to get where we are right now. I mean, it's annoying, but it's so important because we're never going to get past where we are right now unless we go back and say, where did we get it wrong, right? I mean, Right now, anyway. So, um, all right. So he would say that, and he would say that's in the East. You know, he had some vague idea. I think he also, 
probably had some idea of Confucianism and their, maybe their um, ink, black ink drawings. Um, have you ever seen a black ink drawing, the Zen? Go ahead and punch that one. They're gorgeous. I love them. You'll have to go to. Oh yeah, I've seen I've seen black ink drawings. Okay, now think about what yeah. Hegel would think of that. He would think that that it's spiritual, like it's the incarnation of spirit in some way. But it's at this level just of nature, and it's trying to get you to buzz into nature. That's an earlier, less sophisticated view of the incarnation of Geist. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. For most most of the philosophers that we've covered, it is an either or. But for Hegel, there's an, a hierarchy of of art, and it goes through it goes through the Geist. Yeah, and the other thing to really think about, it's so interesting, honestly, because I taught this for years and every time I teach, I was like, oh yeah, there's that. But um, now we go back to Rollo May and he just says there are these certain shapes, right? The Mount yeah. Blanc turns into a shape and Hegel will say, well, you're going to a lower level of Geist, right? It's Geist, yeah. but it's a lower level. I don't think Mr. May necessarily thought, <laughs> right? Yeah. It was lower, right? He just thought if it's spiritual, it's spiritual and it's uplifting. It's an ecstatic experience, whatever. But Hegel definitely, the Enlightenment folks were complete believers permanent progress the human psyche is permanently changing we must remember this yeah. people you know it, i don't even think it would occur to most people that anybody ever really thought it because of so such a primitive level we know we can go to but it is so important that we we know that because we unconsciously keep falling back to it right yeah trump is god's messenger like there's some way to reconcile what it looks like because we are god's people i mean there's books that people we're special right that yeah that american exceptionalism comes from hegel i mean there was a guy francis fukuyama oh he makes me so mad he wrote during the bush he wrote a book, The End of History. And he, you know, he said, well, Hegel got it wrong. It's actually the United States where history ends, you know, and the fall of the wall shows that American Christian capitalism, blah, blah, bullshit. And, yeah. and I saw an interview where he has gotten this huge Carnegie scholar position, like extremely prestigious. And he even said, well, I got everything wrong before. <laughs> and the guy says, oh, but you had a lot of good ideas. It's like bullshit. Get, get him out of there. Makes me so mad. But anyway, um, he did regret it. Like he decided, oh, the American empire trying to you know, have 134 military bases in the Mideast to get cheap oil isn't necessarily like the end of history. I don't, I don't know what his reason was, but oh, that made me mad. Does that, can you understand why that would make me so mad, Liam? Yeah. Like, the Bushies use that, like they hid behind this intellectual with all this bullshit. But anyway, yeah. my point it is- always it always comes back to the ivory tower stuff. It does to me because I mean, I, Hey, maybe I'm just jealous. I really wished I could have did that. And I had to take care of my kids. I don't think so. <laughs> I think I had to have yeah. my feet on the ground and I never let the stuff go off, off the rails. Um, but anyway, so now let's go back. We have Rollo May, 
Then we have Collingwood. Does he think it's all the story of higher and higher development of Geist? No. Remember, there was folk art and then the industrialization, and then it becomes bread and circuses. And then we have to find deep and powerful emotions somehow. But I don't think he ever said, but somehow these will be deeper and more powerful because we went through the industrial yeah. revolution. <laughs> I don't think so, right? Yeah, it's just it's just a progression into and different forms of art. There's no levels of spirituality or significance. Just deep and powerful emotions, right? Um, yeah. I don't think he he. I mean, he he did feel like folk art represents deep deeper and more powerful emotions because people were connected in communities, which, you know, but he didn't want to go back to it. He just felt like, well, we, we got industrial, but we got to figure out how to not to lose our humanity or cover, recover it. Right. Um, yeah. But that, that would be Hegel, right. Spirit moving, you know, sort of inevitably in the same direction. Okay. Now think of Berger right, who said capitalism made everything material and now all we have is glamour. And if we just gone with Marx, right? <clears throat> yeah. But he doesn't, again, he doesn't have this diehard everything's going forward thing, right? And I'll yeah. tell you, Marx is, Hegel was his teacher this is important, right? Because Marx, yeah. Marx also has this view, actually, maybe Berger would believe this too, that, that the economy is driving history, not Geist, right? You know, uh, Hegel says Geist and uh, Marx says, no, it's the body, but it is driving us toward higher and higher levels of civilization. It's just that you yeah. have to get rid of, you know, feudalism. So here's another interesting thing that Hegel's view, if you noticed, was that there's a thesis, especially with Kant, it came to a head, and an antithesis, and he said, with Kant, we have the duty, we have the reason, and then we have the body. And then there's synthesis. So Hegel is uh, history, thesis, um, antithesis, synthesis. Thesis, antithesis, and it is going forward. So with art as sensuous and the symbols are chaotic and not representative. That was the thesis was that there's some kind of spirit, right? And the antithesis was the body. So there's some sense and then synthesis. Oh, well, you can actually realize Geist in images of a physical body. And that's where you have the gods, right? So the gods yeah. are spiritual, but they're portrayed in a physical body, right? So yeah. that's more, that's a synthesis, a higher synthesis. And yeah. then the next one is actually the gods' stories are about people, <laughs> right? And so you can actually incarnate in people's lives, right? Really much more yeah. embodied. So spirit is moving toward, acting in history, but becoming more and more incarnated into the culture. Okay? Um, yeah. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yeah, I, that makes sense. Okay, so Marx, I don't know, have you ever read the manifesto? Um, I have read parts and I have the, his, I have the benefit. I've read the Communist Manifesto. It's Dust Capital. I haven't finished that one. I read parts, so I have read the okay. Manifesto because it's much shorter in comparison. What was the other thing you read? Um, 
Dust Capital, but I haven't read all of it. I read parts yeah, okay, because it's, it's okay. very long. It's just, he says there was feudalism and that went way back, you know, just fiefdoms, just farms. I don't know, you could say that was even in China. I don't know how far back, because all he cares about is the West. All any of them care about is the West. Because yeah. this is where everything is moving forward and everybody else is going to be just like us if they're lucky. So, okay. So yep. there was feudalism, but then um, the guys in the town started selling stuff as it got, you know, tech uh, skills. So like they would make a plow, right? And it's like, ah, this yeah. is easier than oxen. So they'd go buy the plow and then yeah. they'd make something else. And pretty soon the burgers in the town were a bigger economic force than the farm uh, knights or whatever, aristocrats, yeah. the, the estate owners, right? And so that's yeah. thesis antithesis. So the feudal system created its own enemy and then that exploded into capitalism because the the burgers in the town now are the ones that run a capitalist economy right and yeah. then capitalism depends upon a proletariat class and it goes yeah. international and the proletariat becomes more and more conscious of its oppression and so capitalism creates this whole body of workers that are dis disaffected. And so that yeah. will create the communist revolution. And it is inevitable like that. Does that make sense? And yeah. he said, when you have socialism, then the spirit is incarnated in history. Because before that you had religion, religion is an indication that people are being oppressed. So they have to invent a just world after they die, right? Yeah. Religion is the drug of the people, the opiate of the people. But he did think that once we get where everybody can just take turns with these jobs and have some leisure time and bond with people and use their brains and make art, and then Gorbachev came along and he just said, well, Marx didn't anticipate the technological revolution, which is a perfectly legitimate argument, right? Yeah. Because the manufacturing, the manufacturing era, you could have intellectuals go to the farms and farm, you know, you could share jobs a lot uh, because yeah. they never were that complicated. You didn't have to go to college for most jobs, yeah. right? You just make sure the elites stay in touch with the workers. Um, yeah. And so Gorbachev just said, well, Marx wasn't wrong. It's just that now we have to do what we need to do to incarnate, you know, to have a just world with a um, technological economy. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, that hasn't worked out real well. <laughs> So that's, that's a long story. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's one um, effect of Hegel, right? Uh, historical um, influence of Hegel. There are still people who think this way. And then, um, okay, so let me see, where did that, oh yeah, all right. So the Greeks have these gods that are, portrayed as really perfect bodies, perfect sensual being. Yeah. And then the next step would be um, Christian art, right? Yeah. Um, and it would have these Christian themes, like, you know, Jesus being taken off the cross, right? It's, yeah, yeah okay, because it, the theme of it is that Geist is beyond the body, right? You sort of die and die to the 
the body and it's a spiritual reality and jesus died you know for your sins right you can yeah. have your sins washed away and then you can be liberated into this world of the spirit plus the theory of the incarnation right that jesus was god and human at the same time yeah. okay very good um so then i think he would say the catholic church if you think about it but they stole it all from the greeks it was funny the history behind it is that they couldn't get the greeks to convert because the greeks like yeah. their system so what they did is they got all the artists together and they built the church of daphne in athens and i would love to see it but there was an earthquake and it's not, you can't go in. But, you know, they dedicated all that architecture, all that art, all that sensuality to yeah. spirituality, right? Christian spirituality. Yeah. And it works. <laughs> yeah. So all those things that you associate with the Catholic church, those are yep. stolen, right? It's just yep. that, you know, and if you think about the Greeks, we're also incarnational, right? I would yeah. say even more so, really. They're more psychologically aware of the way people actually are. But um, so his view is that using that sensuality in much more symbolic ways, right? If you go into a Catholic church, they use um, sight, because the windows are way at the top of the cathedral. Okay, so the whole thing is designed as a rocket ship to heaven, right? Yeah. So you're out there in the middle of a city and it's dirty and noisy and yucky and you walk into this cathedral and it's just like another world. Whereas yep. in, in Greece, you walk up the hill slowly to the temple. So you're integrating, right? This doesn't remove itself. Yeah. Um, and so that's where Hegel would say it's a lower level of spirit. Um, but he would also say the Catholic church uh, was still, the spirit was still not as incarnated as it is in the Lutheran church because Martin, because the priests were the mediators between God and the people, right? So they always had to tell people how to realize God in their lives, okay? And yeah. that's where Martin Luther got in big trouble. And he said, I have to follow my conscience. Um, yeah. Here I stand, I can't do otherwise. And he talked about the priesthood of all believers right? And so that's a deeper incarnation of Geist in each person without a mediator. Yeah. If that makes sense. And I mean, it's interesting because after Haeckel, all these denominations, especially the Baptists, right? Well, you know, I mean, in Luther's day, the peasants revolted. I mean, all these revolutions because there was economic yeah. oppression too, right? It wasn't just religious. And Luther reacted. He said, everybody has to be either Lutheran or Catholic. Um, he actually supported the war where 30,000 peasants were killed because they were rebelling against economic oppression, right? So he was... Yeah. He was, you know, even though he rebelled against the church, he still was a pretty black and white thinker, I think. But on yeah. the other hand, those Baptists, they can say any old thing and call it God, right? So yeah, they, they split off science. Oh, yeah, that was the other thing, science. So Hegel thought Germany was the incarnation because they had Lutheranism. And they had a republic, people elect their officials, 
who take turns ruling and being ruled, and they had science. So they're going to have scientific progress within this context of spiritual incarnation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so at least you can, I mean, you can understand why the Germans were, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, in the history of philosophy, it seems like there's a lot of emphasis on Germans being right. Well, I don't read that bullshit because, first of all, it has the university model, which is just sick. And I mean, Liam, those guys, I mean, that was the model, the detached observer, the hyper intellectual. And, you know, one time I was in Germany for a while and I said, I know why all those Germans sit and write scholarship. Like the weather is so bad. <laughs> Nobody yeah. in Greece is going to do that. They're going to go outside and have a good time. <laughs> the weather is so awful. It's cold and rainy. <laughs> but they won't say that. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, it's just, oh, Heidegger. He Heidegger was a Nazi. He liked the Nazi ideology and he never apologized. And he was having an affair with a Jewish woman, student. It's just so disgusting. And there's still many, many philosophers that are Heideggerians or they read Plato through the lens of Heidegger. And it's just like, you think like Heidegger, you're gonna become Heidegger. And so what I'm really worried about, Liam, is that they, st they hate the masses, right? They have disdain for the mob. And so they, yeah. they just detach themselves. Well, then they start getting paranoid because they have little kids. They want their kids to have this great education. And so they become not only disgusted and removed, but like they're afraid. Yeah. I think they're going to start voting conservative. Does that make yeah. sense? They didn't do yeah. anything, but that's so Plato, like Socrates is out there trying to prevent it, right? He's leaving his yeah. kids at home and trying to save Athens from destroying herself. There's, it's, Okay, Liam, if you go to grad school, it's bound to be stuff like this going on. And it yeah. should, oh, oh, it's funny, Liam, I found out you're on the search committee for my- I am. I mean, it, I just, it's going to be very interesting. Have you looked yeah. at, um, I mean, already you know that I'm different than, <laughs> than a lot of yeah. them, but- they're also different from each other. I mean, philosophy is anything. Um, yeah. We haven't, we haven't gotten any information on candidates yet, have we? Oh, really? I don't know because I some of them are emailing me, right? And asking yeah. me, is it worth my mile to apply? Uh, yeah. So I know, God, there's these people that are just obsessed about phenomenology. And that's a post-con, you know, and of course, Liam, don't hire her. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can't are... influence you. I can't influence you. <laughs> there are intellectual red flags, but I know I know the areas of philosophy that we have some strong professors in, and I know that there are some places that we're going to be lacking here soon. Well, so, actually, there, there aren't going to be any philosophy professors. You know, John is leaving yeah. and... I actually, I'm willing to do some stuff adjunct if students will yeah. um, sign up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Lion, Lion College in philosophy is in a weird spot right now. But I was the only one there for 27 years. So, you know, yeah. it's no weirder than it would have been if I had just left quickly you know what I mean yeah it seems like it's more disrupted than it actually is does that make sense yeah, yeah. Um, I and also I'm I'm biased to thinking that things are weird with fewer professors because giant high school and experience with bigger colleges and that stuff still not fully used to the small liberal arts college stuff okay it's also 
it's always true that the students, when somebody leaves, oh, it's never going to be the same. Oh, you know, we're going to lose yeah. Mr. Cole. And, you know, uh, you know, some of those students never quite get over it, but they graduate. And a couple years yeah. later, oh, I love Mr. So-and-so. And I'd say overall, we're always trading up. Um, yeah. Okay. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about it. So oh, nobody's going to replace me. <laughs> I don't think yeah. that. For, you know, There's... I don't know. There's never truly a shortage in intellectualism, just the wrong focus. Well, you know, the thing is, the last time they were looking for somebody who was progressive, plus they knew the tradition, right? Yeah. And I know it, and I think people ought to know it, just to, just not because it's right, it's wrong, but we're still exporting this crap and we're still colonizing people's minds. And, and yeah. we ourselves, because you're in rural Arkansas, you know people think in these extremely backward ways. I'll never, like I cannot convince my Indonesian colleagues of things like 25% of our Kansans are taught to hate science. Like they, it's just, they can't process this. They have this yeah. image of America as having this fantastic educational system, but that's because they only send their, their students there for graduate school, right? Yeah, yeah, it's I very mean, skewed. You cannot explain it. You can't explain that two thirds of Americans get way worse education than every Indonesian kid in the villages, you know? Isn't yeah. that crazy? Like the average, the average kid in an Indonesian village knows five languages. Hot damn. They know Bahasa Indonesian, because you have to yeah. do that at school. They know their village dialect, right? Because they're going to yeah. have, yeah. And then they know at least one other village dialect, because one of their relatives might have a dialect, right? Then they yeah. know they know Arabic. They take Arabic classes in grade school. And then in third grade, they have to start learning English. Can you believe that? I can believe it, but it is baffling. It is, it's just, and you know what happens if you never ever think in a different language, right? You lose, it's weird. I've seen some, some of the studies on, on language and the process of thinking it's wacky anyway just, i don't know i guess you know this is all related is geist really moving forward really it's related to hegel um yeah uh anyway so let's see let me go back we only have 15 minutes we can go back to the you know the original questions but also, did you understand what those newspaper articles, how they were related to Hegel? Yeah, after after reading more Hegel, because I read the articles first, and <laughs> then I read Hegel, because I did it in a little bit of an odd order. Um, and and afterwards, yes. But while I was doing it, I did not understand it at all, because they were my first exposure. Um, right. If, if if I can and not take up, but ask a question over them, over and to fill some of this time, can we can we reestablish the Hegel hierarchy as it is, right? So that I can okay. Write so, guys, realizes itself. Yeah, actually, to talk about that, three levels. Um, so, did you manage to to read this just this one page or so about that kind of summarizes his position? You might want to go back over that. I couldn't download it last time. But yeah, I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember reading that one. Okay, it's just I try to give you this context, right? Yeah. So I might have, but I don't remember. So ultimately, there's this free exercise of Geist, right? And it's moving through yes. this 
And um, it embodies itself in three ways. So art is the lowest because it's just that level where you take your senses, very basic way of operating, and you become self-consciously aware of them by making yeah. a painting or writing a piece of music. So you, you do, it's just self-conscious awareness, right? So Geist yeah. is the spirit becoming conscious of itself, right? So art, first of all, it's pictures of nature. Then it's these, yeah. then it's this crazy symbolism in the East. Then it's this Greek uh, embodiment of body, focus on body. And then it's the Christian art that's, the symbols are not crazy like they're in the East. They're very deliberate and they're about dying to the body and being reborn in the spirit, but in an incarnational way. Jesus is the incarnation, right? Okay, then the next layer is theology, which makes sense, right? So you have Jesus incarnating the union of the divine and human, and here it got united in Jesus Christ. And yeah. then you go from that story and that art to theology, right? You start thinking about God, right? Yeah. And so then you have all this theology, which the Germans had tons of theology. You had a lot of intellectuals. You can see why. Like, I am literally Geist, you know, incarnating in history. So I'm going to take myself really seriously. <laughs> so they have a lot of theology. And that's trying to explain this incarnation. And that the very act of doing theology is that you are incarnating the spirit in the activity of theology. And it's a higher activity than art. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it comes through the mind, right? Theology has to be in your mind and then expressed through words. So it's even more obviously a higher level of self-conscious awareness because it isn't anything you see with your eyeballs, right? Yeah. Well, then after that is philosophy. So philosophy, a la Hegel, is the one, the highest, because it explains what all this other stuff is, right? Yes. Because all of it's going on, it's just that somebody has to explain that all of this has a meaning and it's all heading in a direction. And that's where philosophy brings heaven to earth and explains yeah. that the highest level of self-conscious awareness and then he says that the church when it comes to theology uh the lutheran church is the highest because it's the my conscience everybody's conscience has come to earth in yeah. this certain church that that affirms that then you have a republic where people vote and they take turns ruling and being ruled. So you have this incarnation. Um, so Geist is incarnated, not just in an individual people, but also in institutions. Institutions yeah. are really important. Institutions aren't detaching us from our humanity. You know, They're not about money and power. And then you alienate people again. They're actually yeah. manifestations of spirit that make, make it more possible, right? People born into this culture with these institutions are going to be able to incarnate Geist just by virtue of participating in yeah. all the cultural. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so then you have... Um, uh, Lutheranism, Republic, and science, right? So science is also part of this incarnation of Geist, or science can be harnessed to the incarnation of Geist. Okay, that's it. So he's answering Kant, um, and he's answering Hume. So Hume was 
if you're going to develop empathy, you never get past sensuous art, right? You don't do symbolic art. You're trying to cultivate empathy, right? Yeah. I mean, to do the spiritual stuff is to detach yourself from people and from your own humanity. So yeah, the empiricists would say, this is nuts, like you're going the wrong way. We have to do more and more empathy. Okay, so the art would be Sunday afternoon in the park or going to the carnival or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then Kant was, you know, the goodwill, your duty, and then sensuality were split, either or, not both, right? Yeah. Kant said, if you act on uh, pleasure and pain, it's the antithesis of a goodwill. And if you act on a goodwill, your only emotion is the desire to follow the goodwill. And then your sensuality should be pretty just color, shapes, and design, right? Yeah. So, so then Kegel is saying, no, no, that's just too dualistic. And actually, guys, is incarnating in human life at a much deeper level than that. So your theology is not just follow the moral law. And your politics is not just the laws are your duty, right? Um, yeah. Okay. It's much more that your whole person is incarnated through activities, through being an active participant in this culture. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, then... Let's go to those articles for a minute. Um, I, I did this because I wasn't, I kept it on there because I wasn't sure it would download. All right, so here we go. This one is about going to see a woman fil filmmakers. And, and in theory, there are Hegelian types. Oh, you know, we're incarnating spirit, you know, because we have women filmmakers, like we're, evolving culturally does that make sense yeah okay and what did she say they said wait a second there's always the damsel in distress right and and some of it you know it has deeply complex female characters um you know it's certainly it's a more better portrayals of women than the standard right um yeah but um, it always seems to end up, they still rely on the men around them to find the solutions to their problems. So she just says it's falling back, right? And so, I mean, that is about how are we really incarnating humanity into the culture or not? The next one was about is there, is there any level of violence and vulgarity that you just don't portray on the screen, right? Yeah. And um, first of all, I don't think Hegel thought we would be experiencing those violent, vulgar emotions. That's a problem, right? Yeah. And so, um, the, the key to me is like the Greeks portrayed it, but in a very ordered way so that there would be a catharsis. Whereas these portrayals are not like designed to purge, right? Yeah. Because they're based on empiricism, like moral relativism. I'm just describing, you know, I'm just the detached observer or the sensitive person. Um, did you have an opinion about that? No, I, I, I didn't read it critically enough to make an opinion. Okay, but I do think it would, you know, it's going to come up, right? Actually, I know uh, Quentin Tarantino, right? I had a student that really liked his movies. And so she, 
you know, there was some dog something movie. I'm like, I watched the first hour and I'm telling you, it ruined my whole weekend. Like my weekends are to get away from all this weirdness and all the psychological sickness in Batesville. And it really wrecked me, right? I really needed yeah. relief. I just, you know, she just really thought Quentin Tarantino was teaching us about our emotions. I just thought, I thought in the big picture, he was trying to become more violent than the average movie in order to make us disgusted. But I just think a lot of people just even go there, you know? They don't yeah. even think that, I mean, it, so she wrote a good paper because I think she really thought it was purgative, but she really knew that most people aren't understanding that. Does that make sense, uh, Leo? Yeah, yeah would, that makes sense. It would be a problem given how much violence we have in movies. How do you have violence in a way that makes Americans disgusted with violence, right? How are yeah. you going to get them to stop sentimentalizing violence and becoming sort of assimilated to it? So I do think it's a it's a good question, but oh my God, I'm I'm not convinced that it that was the ultimate effect of it. Um, he was very popular for a while, but I just think it was people thought it was entertaining. Anyway, yeah. it's scary. But you, yeah. I'm sure you have your own examples. Oh my gosh, no, Zora Hurston. Did you read this article? I did not read that one. Okay. Well, the, I idea, know that. Yeah. the idea is that in Alice Walker's view, Zora was expanding people's consciousness, right? A black woman can be that independent minded and she was over in the black renaissance she grew up in a town where black people ran the town she was ahead of her time and she had all this stuff to say and the reviewers just trashed her and she became afraid and ellis walker said i've been there i got trashed when i wrote the color purple but i somehow was able to be more immune and resilient so Zora Hurston end up buried in a poor people grave because she had nothing. Nobody knew. Isn't that sad down in the South? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I think you should read it in the sense that we still debate this stuff, right? Are we yeah. moving forward or not? And so, I, I don't know. I just think it's an amazing article myself. And then... Um, I think I have it backwards, so it's hard to read. You have to start at the last page, I think. Yeah. Um, no, maybe not. You just have to figure that out. Um, and then the Obama, right? When Obama got elected, oh, maybe we really are moving forward in history, right? Those are yeah. a bunch of those damn Yankees up north. Would you just please come down here? Right, yeah. you know, I mean, nobody that lived in Batesville would ever think that because the racist yeah. backlash just started and it did not let up. Um, yeah, and then we got the counterculture, um, counterculture conservatives of, as well as the Trump movement in response and it, more it started radicalization. Out as the Tea Party, the Tea Party that hated Obamacare because it was Stalin. Yep. And, and oh, there was some guy named Beck. Uh, um, but anyway, so, but this is, again, it's naive, but it, it's the same issue. And in America, we are really conflicted about whether we're exceptionalism and we're like cutting edge of history I, I, or whether we're just the plain old, same old vanilla flavored, or I think now because of our blindness, we're worse because we never put any of that, those protections to avoid uh, a regress to a primitive level because we didn't think it was possible. Does that make sense, Liam? Yeah. 
I mean, just for people to believe greed is good shows you they know nothing about history. And they're, and they're not, we're not doing anything to protect against what greed does to societies. Yeah. Right. There were all those civil wars in Europe with the Marxist rebellions. They learned their lesson. Okay. We didn't learn yep. that. So we're really plummeting, I think. Um, all right. So then this is another one, Obama. Um, oh, yeah. But this one, they heard racist comments. So, you know, is this really history moving forward or not? Um, yeah, that's but that's what I wanted to point out to you is that New York Times editorial. I don't read those editorials anymore because I think the editorial is I never liked them that much, but I really don't like them anymore. They're much more ideological and I can't stand it. Um, yeah, I did find on YouTube some of my favorite folks. I just found them and I'm just going to go with that. Um, but here, see, on behalf of the baby boomers, you know, we have to, you have to, we have to get a little round of applause because we did a lot of stupid things, George Bush, but we also got Obama, right? Um, yeah. But I, again, I just think that's bullshit. Um, there's, you can't. <laughs> uh, anyway, I thought actually because the '60s. Vietnam War demonstrations were about American imperialism. Are we going yeah. to really be imperialistic or are we going to actually be democratic? And clearly the empire builders have won. Yeah. They're not going to build an empire. They're going to fail, but they're going to destroy our society in the process. Um, the trouble this time is we could take life on earth with us. That's the only difference. I mean, I wouldn't mind. We're an empire in decline. It's the way it is, but we're taking the natural world with us, which is going to kill everybody. That's that's the yep. thing. But main point is that at this point in history, we're still in this enlightenment. Everything is progressing. The psyche is not blank. There's Geist, but it can be completely molded to this point where it's going to be at this higher level permanently. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So next one is Tolstoy. An interesting counter argument. All right. There always were counter arguments to the Enlightenment. Um, his thing is basically a generic Christianity, uh, a socialist where people identify with each other. So he's sort of back into Christian humanism as kind of like that old folk culture of Collingwood, right? The basic emotion. Yeah. Uh, but this time within the context of science and technology. But you'll have to see what you think of it. It's just, you should understand that there were people that didn't accept that basic enlightenment uh, optimism. Uh, there were always yeah. the counter voices, but it just keeps the enlightenment belief just keeps coming back. Even the fundamentalist fascists are thinking we're the city on the hill. <laughs> we can do no wrong, you know? Yeah. And then we're going to get to Dewey, so. so. You'll get there. I don't know after you told a story, you can, maybe you'll anticipate Dewey. I'm not sure, but it, it all fits. It, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Liam. I don't know where Ivy came after. That's, I don't know. Again, always remember, I, you know, doesn't yeah. help. She tries, she, she really tries. She's oh, got yeah, a lot. Moment. She's a got a deal. Up. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Ivy, I'm going to make you watch this thing before I talk to you, but okay. Bye-bye. I'll see you what next Tuesday. Yes. Tuesday. Next or Tuesday. actually, is it? Yes. Yeah, Tuesday morning, your time, right? Yeah. Tuesday morning, my time. Okay. Yeah. Tuesday night, my time. So I will see you then.